How can you believe in God when there is so much evil and People. suffering? Isn't Christianity just blind faith? Why are Christians so What does God have to do with our sexuality? Why do we believe the Bible is real? Why are Christians so hypocritical? This is not inclusive of other faiths and beliefs. Why are Christians not inclusive of other faiths and beliefs? Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, or many rooms. If it were not true, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. One of his followers, Thomas, said, well, Lord, we, we don't know where you're going. How will we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There was a time when I was in college, I had lost my way. I wasn't sure that a personal God had a personal plan for my life. I uh, was majoring in religious studies at Vanderbilt University. I studied uh, with my classmates Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism. My professors in the religion department took kind of a secular, humanistic view of the phenomena of religion. And so especially in my sophomore, junior years, I wondered, who's right? Uh, my Sunday school teachers who believed the Jesus of the Bible or my college profs who taught that every single religion is kind of man-made superstition with a little bit of wisdom mixed in. Was God really a personal God who had a plan for my life? Or was God some kind of an impersonal force or maybe someone who is a figment of our imaginations? Who's right? So while I wondered that with an O, I also wondered with an A. <laughs> because I was struggling with whether or not I believed that Jesus indeed was the only way to God, my lifestyle began to slip. I began to go places I shouldn't go, do things I shouldn't do, say things I shouldn't say, drink things I shouldn't drink. And that plan that God had for my life, I was not on a path to his plan. Not at all. So aren't Christians narrow-minded, intolerant bigots to believe that Jesus is the only way to eternal life I didn't have a good response to that question. And you know what? It was showing up in my lifestyle. So maybe you're like I was. You're not sure of God's plan for your life. You're kind of a semi-fan of Jesus, but you're not so sure why he has to be the only way for everybody. Or maybe you're here today and you're from a different faith background. And I want you to know, you're welcome here. And while we totally respect your culture, your upbringing, and your faith journey, I just want to ask you today, for the next few minutes, just to open your mind and your heart and consider the exclusive claims of Christ. Or maybe you uh, once believed that Jesus is the only way to God, but you haven't had a significant conversation about Jesus with somebody else in a long, long time. Why is that? It's because teachers and Professors and newscasters and friends and relatives and neighbors, they accuse us, Christians, of being narrow-minded and dogmatic, and we don't want to be labeled as that kind of a Christian. Plus, we all know some Buddhists and Muslims and skeptics who are really good people, better, maybe better people than some of the Christians we know. And surely God wouldn't send someone like that to hell, Right? Well, the purpose of this message is just to lay out why we firmly believe that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be, and he's the only one who has the keys to unlock heaven's door. 
Now, Pastor Chad gave us a way to remember the trustworthiness of the Bible. Do you remember that? He talked about S-H-A-P-E. We believe the Bible because of its shape, supernatural, historical, archaeological, prophetic, eyewitness evidence. Well, today we're going to use another acronym. All right? It, it, I believe Christianity is true and that Jesus is the only way, W-A-Y, to be saved because of W, the words of our Lord, the answers for our questions, and the yearnings in our hearts. So why Jesus is the way? Words, answers, yearnings. Can you say it with me? Words, answers, yearnings. There will be a test on your way out today. You can't go home until you can say that back. So let's just dive into it. Words of our Lord. In our passage for today, Jesus says, John 14, 6, I am the way, and no one comes to the Father unless he comes through me. And we are told today that it's arrogant and intolerant to make exclusive religious claims to truth. Because we're told that all religions lead to God, and because I believe that, I'm a tolerant person, but you Christians are intolerant and you're arrogant. How dare you say that your way is the only way? But stop and think about this a minute. People who make inclusive, pluralistic, all roads lead to God religious claims in the name of tolerance are just as guilty of the same intolerance that they criticize. Because they think that anybody who disagrees with the inclusive view is wrong. The religious pluralist thinks what he believes is true. And therefore, devout Christians, devout Muslims, devout Jews are wrong. And if you don't agree with him, then you're mistaken. And you know what? That's just plain old exclusive. That's just plain old intolerant. My friend Randy Chestnut says this. The issue becomes, which exclusive position will you embrace and why? That's the issue. Jesus Christ is the hinge point of history. And if you deeply consider the words of Jesus, I think you'll be stunned by what he has to say about himself. I mean, for those of us that go to church, it's like, okay, Jesus said this, Jesus said that. We kind of get numbed by it. But if you just step back and go, dude, what was this guy saying? It's amazing. Think about a few of the things that Jesus said about himself. If your friends or your neighbors or your relatives say it, then you would think that they're out of touch with reality. And one of them is right here in John 14, 6. I am the way. I am the way. Several months ago, we spent time on Sundays in a series of messages on the I am statements of Jesus. And this is one of them. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But my question for you, some of you weren't here for that series, but some of you were. So for those of you who were here, do you remember some of the other I am statements of Jesus? Just call them out. Shout it out. I am the, the door. Oh, you guys are sharp, man. I'm hearing everything all at once. All right, well, let's start with the door. I'm the door. That's in John chapter 10. Wait a minute. <laughs> Chill. It's okay. We'll get over there. The door. What does he mean? He goes, if you want to get to heaven, you're going to have to go through me. The sheep have only one way into the sheepfold. And my sheep, you guys, only get one way into heaven's gate. All right, good shepherd. That's also in John chapter 10. And what he's saying when he says, I'm the good shepherd, he says, I'm the one who will lay down my life for the sheep. I will come and die on a cross to pay for their sins. It's an audacious claim. What else? I am the vine. The vine. That's in stereo. That's cool. <laughs> That's in John 15. And when he says, I'm the vine, he says, you're a branch, and you're going to plug into me, and the only way you're going to live a productive life, the only way you're going to have fruit is if you stay connected to me. That's an audacious claim. All right, we got some more. The resurrection and light of the world. Okay, I'm the resurrection and the life. He says, if you believe in me, even though you die, you will live. That's an audacious claim. 
I am the light of the world. Everybody is walking in darkness unless you're connected to me. And if you're connected to me, then you're in the light. There's one more I am statement. I am the bread of life. That's in John chapter 6. He says, if you want to live, then you're going to have to eat of me. Now, if I said even one of those things here, I'm the bread of life. If you want to have life, you have to eat of me. You guys should just get up and walk out and not look back. But these are the kinds of things that Jesus said all the time. And he said more than this. He goes, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And oh, by the way, I am the I am who spoke to Moses in ancient Israel from a bush that didn't burn up. I'm the God that spoke to Moses out of that bush. What kind of person says that kind of stuff? Audacious claims. See, Jesus made claims that are different than any other religious, religious leader in the world. They would give principles about how to live. Now, Jesus certainly did that, but he did more than that. He claimed to be the source of the principles. Jesus was God come down on a visit to earth. And it's a much-used quote that I think bears repeating. Lewis says, C.S. Lewis, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. Well, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. See, based on the fact that Jesus claimed to be more than a man, we are left with a trilemma. He's a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's the Lord. And if he is Lord, then what he says here in John 14, 6 is actually true. No one comes to the Father unless they come through him. So if someone ever accuses you of being arrogant and narrow-minded and bigoted and intolerant because you believe Jesus is the only way, you can say, well, your problem is not really with me. Your problem is really with Jesus because he's the one who's saying he's the only way. And for many reasons, I've just chosen to believe him. And man, I hope you believe him too. Why do believe that there's only one way and that way is through Jesus? First, words. Words. The words of our Lord. Do you remember the A? Answers. Okay, some of you do. Answers. Words. Answers. Answers for our questions. Now people say all religions are basically the same. Now that's what the tolerance police want us to say. But think about it. Uh, I have here some books. <clears throat> I have The Hungry Caterpillar. Okay? Awesome book. I have The Works of William Shakespeare. Also awesome. And then my favorite, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets by J.K. Rowling. Okay? Now, now, what if I said to you, after reading these three books, I have decided that all of literature is basically the same. Now, what would you say about that? Would you say, dude, that is the most profound thing I've ever heard anybody say about literature? Or would you say, Rick, you've been smoking something, man. <laughs> See, when somebody says all religions are basically the same, they've been smoking something. Um, it suggests if a person says that, that they haven't actually really looked into the religions. Because once you do, you realize it's not that most religions are fundamentally the same with superficial differences. 
It's that most religions are fundamentally different with superficial similarities. At the heart of every religion is a particular way of defining who God is or isn't and then how we're supposed to live in light of that. And they're different. Now notice Jesus says in John 14, 6, not only I am the way, but he also says I am the truth. So in Christ we find true answers to life's essential questions. Answers for life's life's questions. There are basically four essential questions that every view and every religion has to answer. Origin. Where did we come from? Meaning. Why are we here? Morality. How are we supposed to live? And then destiny. Where are we headed? Now, common worldviews have widely divergent answers to these questions. Uh, Origin. Secularists would say, we're here through a process of evolution and natural selection that goes with it, and that there is no personal creator God. Origin. Or meaning. Buddhism says, there's no personal God at all. All that exists is the product of an eternal chain of cause and effect. So what we perceive as reality is really illusion. Morality. Hinduism teaches that you can be liberated from the cycle of birth, life, and death through your right actions and your right knowledge and devotion. And then destiny. Islam says we gain paradise through faithful submission to Allah and obedience to his commands. So if you want to be saved, go to paradise, then you've got to follow the five pillars of Islam. And if you want to read more about the various views that uh, different religious systems have, then uh, you can pick up a paper that we have out in the foyer. It's written by John Wood, who's a professor at Cedarville University. It's called Apologetics and the Exclusivity of Christ. So we're dealing with those four questions, origins, meaning, morality, and destiny. Now, our faith answers these questions with, you ready for this, a story. This is a story with a capital S. It's a story that millions and millions and millions of people for for thousands of years have found to be satisfying to the very depths of their souls. Now think about stories. Think about stories you love. Maybe you didn't know. Pixar follows a basic plot line. They have a storyline. They have a story spine in all of their films. And it goes like this. Once upon a time, there was, and then every day, Things went great. One day, da, 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 the bad guy shows up. And because of that, things get worse. Because of that, things get worse. Until finally, the hero shows up. And typically through sacrifice, something changes. And ever since that day, they live happily ever after. That's the story spine that Pixar uses. And almost every romantic comedy that you see kind of uses this same storyline. <laughs> we are wired for story. Stories stick in our brains. They stick in our souls. And this is what writers call the story spine. So you see it in movies and novels and short stories that you find compelling. Why do our hearts resonate with this storyline? It's because it points us to a larger, grander ultimate story with a capital S that God himself has written. So, here's what I want you to do. I did this with 815 and 930. They didn't throw stones at me. So what we're going to do is I want you to group up in groups of three or four or five. And I want one person to be the storyteller. And I want you to use that outline, okay? Once upon a time, there was, and you go all the way through... And ever since that day, you finish it up. And here's where you start. Genesis 1, and here's where you end. Revelation 22. So you're going to tell the story of the Bible in one minute. That means you've got 10 seconds for each line. Okay? So we're going to huddle up. One person's going to talk, and uh, the others are going to listen. And so we're ready. Get set. Go. One minute.
Okay. All right. I hope some of you got all the way through. Some of you are probably still in Genesis chapter 3, right? <laughs> this is a rowdy bunch. There must be a lot of great storytellers in this room. All right. So I'm going to... I, obviously, I had this in advance, so uh, I wrote down the story. So, so, so here it goes. Let me give you my version of it. Once upon a time, God created mankind and Adam and Eve. And every day, they walked and talked in perfect relationship with God and each other in a beautiful, peaceful garden. But one day, an enemy, disguised as a friend, appeared and questioned God's love for the couple. He wanted to steal their joy, kill their relationship, and destroy their dreams. The wife bought the enemy's lies about God and rebelled against God's plan. The husband didn't object. In fact, he followed suit, thinking that rebelling against God was no big deal. Because of that, their perfect relationship with God and with each other was broken. And mankind ever since has struggled with sin, selfishness, greed, guilt, and shame. We've been at war with God and with each other. It explains all the pain and heartbreak in this world. Because of that, God created the law. But no matter how hard we tried, we failed to obey God's rules. So we created our own rules and regulations and rituals and religions in order to find peace within ourselves and with God. But nothing worked. We found no hope, only more pain. Until finally, God sent a rescuer, Jesus. He's the example to every person of what can happen when we submit perfectly to God. He died on the cross to take away our shame, remorse, and guilt. He arose from the grave to reverse the curse that had been the destiny for everyone. And ever since that day, we can be restored. When we turn from selfishness and put our trust in Jesus and seek to follow him, he repairs what was broken. And whoever believes in Jesus can have a restored relationship with God, can have victory over sin, and will live with Christ in heaven one day. The end. How about that story? <laughs> you know what that is? It's the story of stories. And that story answers the question of origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Christianity has the, the most comprehensive and the most coherent answers to those questions than any other worldview, any other religion. Why do we believe there's only one way and Jesus is the way? First, because of W, words, words. A, answers, and Y, yearnings. Good, you guys are good. You can go home today, I think. Yearnings in our hearts. So notice Jesus not only says, I'm the way and the truth, but he also says, I'm the life. What's he talking about? He's talking about eternal life. It's a quality of life that you can actually experience here and now, and it's a quality of life that you will experience in heaven forever. He's the source of eternal, full, meaningful, purposeful life. Now, if you think about it, everybody has yearnings. Everybody has desires. Everybody has longings. And what we want is life. And we try to fulfill these desires by pursuing earthly pleasures, and we think that's what's going to give us life, so we go after vacations and jobs and hobbies and houses and cars and relationships, and yet we always end up just a little disappointed or majorly disappointed. C.S. Lewis puts it this way, creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hunger, well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim, well, there is such a thing as water. Men feel sexual desire, well, there is such a thing as sex. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. I was made for this Life. Where Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. I am the life. That's what we were made for. This is what Jesus is talking about the first three verses in John 14. He says, I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you so that when I come, I will receive you to myself so that where I am, there you can always be. Our view of heaven and our view of how you get there by grace, through faith, not works. 
That's what sets us apart from all other religions of the world. You know, if our view of Christ and heaven and eternity isn't true, everybody should want it to be true. <laughs> Why? Because it's the most beautiful, it's the most glorious, it's the most hopeful, it's the most sustaining answer to life's sufferings and the yearnings of our hearts. Why do we believe there's only one way and that way is through Jesus? Number one, words. Number two, and number three, yearnings. Yearnings. Uh, Kyle Korver is a basketball player for the Cleveland Cavs. How about LeBron's shot last night? Whoa. <laughs> a few weeks ago, Kyle's brother, Kirk, died. And maybe you didn't know Kyle's father is a pastor. And uh, the three remaining brothers spoke at the funeral. And then Kyle's father spoke, also his mother. I watched that service. It was powerful. And Pastor Corver talked about John 14, our text for today. And he used it as a way to comfort himself and to comfort others that his son Kirk was with Jesus. And we pulled just a portion of that message for you today. So let's take a look. So I'm from Paramount, California. Lane is from Montezuma, Iowa. Taking Jesus' words and applying them to today. My dad would come from Paramount, California. Together we'd go to Montezuma, Iowa. And my dad would ask Lane's dad if Kevin could marry Lane. If the fathers agreed, there'd be a cup of wine that was given. And that would be given to Lane. If she drank the cup, she's saying, Kevin, my love for yours my life for yours, and that I would do the same. Then I would leave Lane, and with my dad, I would go back to Paramount, California. And for as long as it took, I would build a house on my father's house. When the house was completed, I would go back to Montezuma, Iowa. And I would say, Lane, you come with me. I prepared a place for you at my father's house. Jesus takes that analogy and he says to his disciples, I prepared a place for you. I have a place for you. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't know there. How do you know the way? And Jesus said, I know the way because I am the way. So imagine Lane's in Montezuma, Iowa. She doesn't know where Paramount, California is. She trusts me to know the way. Let me just do something crazy with you. The rabbis in Jesus' day taught this that when a person died, the spirit rose above the burial place and for four days, it floated around the dead body because it did not know where to go. Jesus says he knows the way. I want you to think about this now. Only one person we believe is Christians. One person has been to heaven, has been to earth, has gone to hell, has come back to earth, and has gone to heaven. Only one person knows the way. And the one person comes to those he loves at the moment they die and says, Kirk, I prepared a place for you in my father's house. And what we would say is, Kirky, Kirky, you go with Jesus. That's why being a Christian is such a big deal. Jesus has made a way. Jesus is the way. He is the truth. And our son is more alive right now than he's ever been in 27 years. Wow, that's good. <laughs> now let me hurry to say, Pastor Corver is not saying that the bodies do literally float around the casket for four days. In fact, he said, Jesus comes immediately at that point of death and he takes 
us to the Father's house. He's simply saying what the ancient rabbis believed. The main point is Jesus is the only person qualified to take us to the Father's house. And that's what comforts us in our grief. And that's yet another reason to believe in these exclusive claims of Jesus. Now I've found that when people put their faith in Jesus, it's not usually because of one giant aha moment. Sometimes. But quite often, it's a series of smaller aha moments. Typically, it's not just reason or intellect alone that cause people to embrace Christ. Blaise Pascal said, The heart has its reasons, which reason knows not of. We know the truth not only by the reason, but also by the heart. One of my favorite authors is uh, G.K. Chesterton. He writes this, if I'm asked as a purely intellectual question why I believe in Christianity, I can only answer for the same reason that an intelligent agnostic disbelieves in Christianity. I believe in it quite rationally upon the evidence. But the evidence in my case, as in that of the intelligent agnostic, is not really in this or that alleged demonstration. It is an enormous accumulation of small but unanimous facts. The secularist is not to be blamed because his objections to Christianity are miscellaneous and even scrappy. It is precisely such scrappy evidence that does convince the mind. I mean that a man may well be less convinced of a philosophy from four books than from one book, one battle, one landscape, and one old friend. The very fact that these things are of different kinds increases the importance of the fact that they all point to one conclusion. I love what he's saying. It's the accumulation of all the scrappy evidence <laughs> that makes us believe in Jesus. In this series, we've given six answers to really big questions. And by themselves, each of the answers might seem scrappy. But together, these reasons can be powerfully convincing. And if you add these reasons to those daily little demonstrations that if you have the eyes to see it, God's giving you about his reality, then you'll be convinced that his way is the way. How could you possibly believe there's only one way for people to be right with God? I asked that question on Facebook, and a lot of different CBCers responded. Rosanna Salonica said, My father-in-law, an atheist, asked the same question, and I said, Because my Savior's not in the grave. And all the other religious leaders are. John Zaccardelli says, there's only one key that opens the door to your house. Isn't it okay for God to do the same thing, to have one key that opens the door to heaven? John Rickenbacker said, why did God take the life of his son if he's not the only way? If there were other ways, God would have taken those other ways and spared the life of his son. If you add it all together... I would conclude that the Christian worldview is the most reasonable and the most probable of all the alternatives. All right, so that leads us to the big question. We're wrapping it up here. Here's my big question. So? <laughs> so what? You know, big deal. What difference does it make? And so I want to give you guys a chance to respond to me now. What are the so what's? So what? I can have joy. I can have hope. What else? I can have eternal salvation. I can experience trust. I can have peace and love. Now you guys are quoting Galatians 5, 22 and 23. You know that, right? What else? I can have purpose in life. I can experience transformation. Restoration. All right, you guys are sharp. Give me one more. I said one more, not five more. <laughs> Who said something over here? I could experience growth. Now, as you can imagine, I've got my own so what's, okay, and they're ready for you. So let me just give them. Now, I got four. Here's the first one. Be grateful. Why is there only one way to be reconciled to God? That's a really good question. But maybe a better question is this. Why is there any way at all to be reconciled to God? 
I mean, God didn't have to make a way at all, but he did. And every one of us who have come to faith in God through Christ have reason to be eternally grateful. Someday we'll be standing around the throne and we'll say, thank you, thank you, thank you, over and over and over again. And it'll never get old. Be grateful. Secondly, be prayerful. Um, See, these are the reasons why we pray. You're probably not going to argue or reason somebody into heaven, into the faith. Um, We just need to pray that they will have a series of those small aha moments, that scrappy evidence that will accumulate so that they will believe. That's why we have these little uh, prayer cards with names of people uh, on them that are far from God. They're pinned up over in our prayer room out there. And, and if you don't have one of these cards, I encourage you to stop by the prayer room, get one, fill it out, pin it to the prayer wall so that we can all pray with you. Um, see, we're praying that the scrappy evidence will mount up and that people far from God will believe. Pray for your five. Third, be hopeful. Be hopeful. See, we can be confident We don't need to be shy when people are asking us tough questions. We don't need to apologize about our faith. Listen, you know, I can't believe you believe God's the only way. God can defend himself. God can defend his way. He doesn't really need me to do it. And Jesus stands alone and above and beyond every historical religious figure. The truths of the Bible. They've stood the test of time long before I lived. So I don't need a bunch of coherent answers from me. The Bible can defend itself. Here's what we just need to do. Uh, Let the lion out of its cage. You say, what's the lion? It's the story that we just told. Tell the story. Here's here's the grand meta-narrative. This is the big story. It's the story of stories. That's why we like all those other little stories. And tell about the hero named Jesus who came and rescued people that were dead desperate and without hope. And, and, and watch the lion defend itself. And then fourth, be faithful. Be faithful. If Jesus is the only way to heaven, then all other religions, all other worldviews, all other roads lead to hell. Hell is the absence of God. The Bible says that hell is a lake of fire. Jesus himself said it's a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. He calls it outer darkness. He came to this planet to provide a way of salvation so people wouldn't have to go there. But people we know and love are headed there. And we've got to be faithful and urgent in sharing the good news of Jesus. We have the best story ever, the best Savior ever, the best news ever. Why would we keep it to ourselves? And this is why we constantly beg you, go to Indonesia and share Jesus with these precious people on that island before it's too late. It's why we want to send people constantly to Ghana and Detroit and Appalachia and Mexico and El Salvador. It's why we mobilize people. Let's go plant churches. Let's start a new campus. It's why we give our money here. It's why we're asking you, use your home as a life house in your community so that your neighbors can embrace this one way to be saved. So if Jesus is the only way to be saved, then I've got to have a sense of urgency about getting this news to as many people as I possibly can. We need to understand there's one road to heaven. There are many roads to hell. But once a person is there in hell, he will find there is not one road that leads out. Therefore, we need to be people that get this message to people now. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. And Lord, I just ask you to forgive us for our lack of urgency. Forgive us for our lack of passion and forgive us for our lack of love. Maybe you're here today and you're still not sure Jesus is the only way. And you know what? That's okay for now. 
I pray that God will amass enough scrappy evidence for you soon. And I just want to tell you, go on a journey to investigate whether what we are saying today is true or not. And we've got some resources that we have for you on the screen. More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell. The Case for Faith. Reason for God by Tim Keller. Mere Christianity. Jesus Among Other Gods, Ravi Zacharias. Orthodoxy. And we'll put this on our blog, post it out on Facebook and stuff like that so you can get this. Check it out. If Christianity is not true, then you know what? None of this matters. But if Christianity is true, nothing else matters. You owe it to yourself to go on a journey to figure out, is this stuff really true or not? You know, back in college, when I was struggling with whether my pluralistic, all roads lead to God, professors were right, or my narrow is the way, only Jesus saves, Sunday school teachers were right, I took a trip with a group of friends to Central America. And there in Nicaragua with my friends, we studied a New Testament book, the book of Romans. And I was confronted with the fact, once again, no one can ever be good enough or right with God through their own actions because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He is the one who took the punishment of God on himself and he rose from the dead. And he justifies us. He makes us just as if we'd never sinned. He clothes us in the righteousness of Christ. And spending just those few weeks diving deep into the gospel as it's presented in the book of Romans had a profound influence on my life. I came back from that trip absolutely convinced that my intelligent, more intelligent than me, professors who were pluralistic and secular and non-dogmatic they were inclusivist. Those guys, they just didn't have the capacity, for whatever reason, to see the glory and the beauty and the grace and the love and the mercy of Jesus. And as I leaned into and learned more about the exclusivity and the uniqueness and the majesty and the mystery of Jesus, I found God's plan for my life. And so can you. If you say yes to him, he will be your way, your truth, and your life. Let's pray. Lord, what an awesome Savior, you are. We take you for granted so much. We are people that are bashful and shy and apologetic. Lord, forgive us. Let us be loving and kind, but bold as we share this good news with others. Lord, give us opportunities to share our story, your story. And as we do so, Lord, we just ask you for all those names on that wall in that other room over there, in our prayer room, begin to uh, accumulate the scrappy evidence so that they will come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And we can be surrounding your throne forever and ever, worshiping, having fun, working, serving, learning, growing, relating, connecting. Um, make it all happen, Lord. We believe that you, Jesus, are the way, the truth, and the life. And we all said,